Welcome to Weird Web Radio, an explorer's guide to hidden worlds of the paranormal and occult, reality expanding experiences, and the downright weird and bizarre. With your host, Lonnie Scott. Welcome to another episode of Weird Web Radio. I'm your host, Lonnie Scott. In this episode, we're talking to Evo Dominguez Jr. If you don't know who Evo is, then you may not have been going around the pagan and occult community for very long. Evo's biography in the back of his newest book, Keys to Perception, A Practical Guide to Psychic Development, says, Evo Dominguez Jr. is a visionary and practitioner of a variety of esoteric disciplines. He was a founding member of Keepers of the Holy Chalice, the first coven of the Assembly of the Sacred, a wicked syncretic tradition that draws inspiration from astrology, Kabbalah, and the Western magical tradition, and the folk religions of Europe. A professional astrologer, Evo has studied astrology since 1980, and you can visit him at evodominguezjr.com. What that biography or that little blurb about the author doesn't say, Evo is extremely easy to talk to. He is so much the living embodiment of hospitality. And he shares his wisdom freely, without hesitation. What you're going to get from this conversation with Evo is going to be multiple levels of practical insight and the ability to listen to and speak to a true living elder of any modern pagan tradition is always an honor and a privilege. Wherever you're listening to Weird Web Radio, you can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, and Spotify, or any apps out there available on any of your smart devices. You can also join the Weird Web Radio membership at patreon.com slash weirdwebradio, or just simply click join the membership here at weirdwebradio.com. As always, my friends, stay weird out there. Evo, welcome to Weird Web Radio. I'm really happy to have you here. Great to be here. Um pretty curious and excited to see how this goes. It's an absolute honor to have you here. And right out of the gate, I like to ask a question that gets into the way my guests think about the certain fields they're a part of. So what is one thing you believe to be true about magic beyond skepticism and doubt? Um, That I wouldn't be alive if it weren't for magic that I wouldn't be here without it based on things that have happened in my life. And magic has, uh, you know, kept me alive either because of physical protection or, uh, holding me back in moments when I was looking to head in the wrong direction. When is a time when magical protection became so important? You're sure it saved your life. All right. I'll start with a crisis point uh, in my uh, uh, teenage years. And uh, because we have many topics to cover, I'll keep it short and sweet. But let's just say that uh, mom and dad were not the sanest individuals when it came to a wide range of things, uh, including uh, while I was still a senior year in high school living at home, they were opening my mail and discovered a love letter from a guy, which then resulted in a wide range of emotional and physical abuses, which uh, uh, escalated to basically being held captive at home during the summer between high school and college. And the abuse got to the point where I literally uh, left my body, was floating above my body, looking down at the whole scene, and had the experience and knowledge that this would pass There was absolutely nothing that anyone could do to me that would truly harm me because that was within my power to, and then I went back down into my body, uh, uh, coped with what was and uh, did a little magic to find a way to escape them, which I did within a week after that. So that was just one incident. There've been times when it's been something ridiculous uh, in one regard, but pretty uh, amazing in another. I was about to cross the street in Philadelphia late night. I was at a convention, had been drinking with friends and was talking to friends and wasn't paying attention. And I would have walked straight into a a traffic where somebody was running the stoplight, except loud in my head, I had uh, this enormous loud sound 
just like the warning klaxon for Red Alert in Star Trek because I'm a, enough of a geek for my brain to pull things like that to get my attention. Mm-hmm. And it all, so I heard that noise and it felt like something actually grabbed my shoulder and I would have been clobbered. And I could go on and on, but I've had lots of things where magic, and I'm using magic here in a very broad definition to include um, things that don't necessarily require ritual or um, physical actions to, to uh, enact them. But my whole life has had things which have proven to me that uh, it is woven through every bit of my fate. Yeah, I I agree. I think magic does encompass a great deal more than just ritual. And I mean, we can talk about that. But first, I'd like to know a little bit more about how you even got started on a magical path. I don't think I had a choice. It was either that or decide that my sense of the world was so different than everybody else's that I probably needed to be in a padded cell. Uh, when I was a child, I had lots of uh, imaginary friends, which I suppose many kids do. But I quickly discovered that sometimes my imaginary friends would like, you know, give me real information like, you know, hey, so and so's coming around the corner. You might want to, uh, you know, hide what you're doing or, you know, put your papers back in your desk or. So there was a lot more going on than simply imagination or knowledge of uh, uh, the story I've told most often is we were visiting my uh paternal grandfather and grandmother. And uh, I immediately knew uh, shortly after we arrived at their house that that was the last day that he'd be alive and that he would die that night. And I went to great lengths to talk to him, recorded a conversation or two on cassette tape. And indeed, he had a major stroke and died that, that evening in bed. So I don't think I actually had a way of avoiding it because the only way I could make sense of things was to begin to do a lot of research. So I I did the standard explore lots of different faiths and religions, um, dug up every book that I could find on anything to do with magic, ritual, psychism, uh, you name it. And though there are many things that were, you know, uh, unfortunate about my family situation, there were many things that were very fortunate. My dad was a professor as a professor's kid, I had a library card that got me into the university's library, and I could ask for any book I wanted through your library alone and pretty much get it. And reading was encouraged in my household. So I did a lot of research and, and discovered that uh, there was a lot more going on than simply random events that were not random in my life, but there were systems to try to make sense of and understand how these things worked. And I'd been raised Catholic, um, Cuban Catholic, and in a sense, the idea of uh, doing specific actions to cause certain things to happen was uh, ingrained rather deeply because they didn't necessarily agree. But I don't know if I'm seeing my mom or dad or my aunts or uncles or relatives uh, lighting candles in front of little statues of the saints and asking them to do particular things for them or or uh, you know, doing divination into uh, a bowl of, uh, of water with an egg white uh, at uh, Epiphany or a bunch of other things the family did. It's like, from my perspective, that all looked like magic and, frankly, to some degree, ancestor worship. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, I've talked about this with other guests on the show. Uh, there, there's so many times where you might see a family member you know, lighting candles and saying prayers Mm -hmm. in such a way that, you know, you're not going to find that being taught in the local church. There's something else going on there when you see those practices being done. So, I mean, you've got a healthy access to a library and a Mm -hmm. sounds like a, a, a home where you're at least allowed to explore, maybe a little more secretive, but definitely allowed to read and take the time. When'd you go from reading to actually practicing? Hmm. In well, if you want to go for practicing in a dramatic way, I'm going to say I'm going to say tenth grade in high school. I mean, I'd done lots of little things uh, before then, but uh, I remember in tenth grade uh, talking to other uh, people in, in in my classes about. Uh, science fiction and fantasy. And frankly, I was using that as a way to gauge whether or not uh, I could uh, then take one more step and ask them if they have an interest in magic. And 
there were four of us and uh, I'll say Raymond and, and just leave out the names because honestly, I haven't kept up with them. So I don't know who would be comfortable with what or if they were still involved in magic. But uh, Raymond's parents were very uh, bohemian, hippy dippy. And they let us uh, take over their the basement of their house and, you know, let us uh, uh, paint circles with various symbols on the floor of their concrete, you know, floor of their basement. And we began to experiment with all sorts of uh, magical formula and rituals that we had discovered. And I, and I, and I must say that uh, part of it was really exciting and part of it was really frightening. And uh, I, because I was also involved, I was, a, I was a science geek kid, but I was also into the arts and other stuff. So I had no problem getting, you know, uh, sheets of, uh, of zinc uh, for, from the art class because I was doing etchings, which I was, but I was also collecting copper and zinc and lead and a bunch of other things. Cause we were making amulets. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, what do you need those things? Oh, oh, uh, um, I'm making a battery with a potato. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> maybe. So I started uh, fairly early on. And because my, and I've told the story elsewhere. So my parents desperately wanted uh, all of us to be normal, whatever that meant. And uh, which, by the way, is why I don't have a Spanish accent. They refused to speak English in front of me as a child, so I wouldn't imprint on their accent. Wow. Um, you no, know, no. I mean, I mean, when we moved uh, to Tallahassee, Florida, when I was a kid, uh, and, and this sounds funny, but it's not really funny. I remember that we had uh, family sessions where we'd sit down and they'd put on Hee Haw on the TV and make us watch it. Uh, and so the, and, and make us watch all sorts of other things and make us read things in the paper because they wanted us to acclimate to the local people as fast as possible. Oh, boy. With hee haw. <laughs> well, actually, that worked in Tallahassee. Um, but in any case. So one of the things that they wanted me to do was to be involved in some kind of sport. And I wasn't really a sports kid. But of course, because I like science fiction and fantasy and all sorts of things of that, I took up fencing because, well, all right, if, if I need to do a sport, I'll, I'll, I'll take up fencing. Well, there's no fencing program at a high school, but it was walking distance to the university. So I managed to get an agreement and permissions from uh, everybody so that I could leave the high school and go to the uh, fencing club and the fencing uh, teams training at the University of Delaware. So... As, as uh, fate would have it, uh, one day in the locker room, was changing real fast. One of the other uh, fencers was changing. He was a grad student. So there's an age difference there, and it makes a difference in this story. And as he's changing quickly, this little pentacle pops out from underneath his T-shirt, lands where I can see it. You know, he quickly p shoves it back under his shirt. And I'm looking, and I go, oh, it's a pentacle. So I look at him and go, so are you pagan? Are you Wiccan? Are you Gardnerian? Are you Alexandrian? Or are you just wearing that? Or are you involved in any in Golden Dawn or any of the ceremonial things? And his eyes get bigger and bigger because I'm a teenager. Mm -hmm. He's a grad student. By the way, this is the 70s. Um, and he is freaking out. And, he, and he's kind of like, I'm kind of like cornering him, which is kind of funny because he was, you know, much bigger, you know, a beefier guy. And finally, he says, let's talk about this somewhere else, because he was afraid any moment somebody else would walk in and, and hear about all this. Well, it wasn't exactly extortion, but I got him to add me to the email list for um, his group's uh, newsletter. So I started getting this, you know, or rather, rather snail mail list long before email. So I, I started getting this little newsletter in the mail. And as soon as I turned 18, he said, you can show up at one of our uh, open events where they used to do picnics in a couple of the parks. So that was my, so that my fencing ended up leading to my first encounter with people that actually formally practiced and in fact were, you know, part of a, an initiatory tradition. And I never joined them, but they were my point of connection to hearing about all sorts of other possibilities that existed in my area. It's hard to imagine probably for some of the younger listeners, how much people had to hide. I mean, I was, yeah. I was only born in the late seventies, but you know, coming up into the early nineties in my early mm -hmm. teens, um, I can remember quite a bit of harassment for just simply being openly pagan and interested in the occult. Sure. And I, it's nice to see that, you know, my two of my oldest, 
my two oldest daughters are getting interested now in witchcraft and various traditions and there's there's nothing bothering them in the public world about their mm-hmm. interest and i think it's wonderful to see that their generation is letting a lot of that baggage go so as time goes by you've become obviously who you are now of quite respected within the pagan and the occult world. Uh, what does your path and your practice look like today? Well, um, I still meditate every single day. And uh, a lot of people think that, that uh, too much is made of encouraging people to meditate. But having meditation, even if it's just a few minutes or any other part of your day, taking time to allow your mind to be clearer, sharper, and focus just on its own existence, its own presence, makes a big difference in anything and everything that you do, not just the magical or spiritual part. So I always meditate every day. First thing in the morning is usually what I try to do. But before I even get out of bed, I try if, if I can, because I know how busy my days are. And I have, uh, I'm not going to call it a caseload, but I'll call, yeah, I'll, I'm going to call it a caseload. I have uh, on any given day phone calls or meetings with people that are either part of one of our covens or are members of the broader uh, magical, spiritual, pagan, heathen community that I have um, contact with either as a mentor or as a peer, so that I have a lot of, you know, daily connection of that sort. Um, I have a writing schedule every day. I write X amount, whether uh, though today's writing, uh, which is happening later is not focused on, uh, an essay or a blog. It's a uh, stuff material for a class that I'm doing this weekend. And because I'm also part of a community of people, a tradition, uh, I also write things that are just for internal use that aren't necessarily for the outside world. Uh, I try to also do a practice of, I don't get it done everybody in one day. It usually takes me about uh, two, three weeks, but I try to hold each person that's part of my extended magical community in my mind's eye and just refresh my energetic and emotional connection to them so that when they do um, call out of nowhere, or I suddenly get a flash about something, I still have a fresh line of connection to the people that I'm part of. I guess, I guess I'm going to say that my current job, uh, which is uh, an elder in a community, but uh, for, for us, that primarily means that you're glue. Uh, your, your work is about refreshing and, and reweaving the connections between individuals and, and different working groups uh, and different covens, at least covens of the system that we have. And also looking for planning what's the next thing the community outside of us need because we reach out as much as we reach in. And I do ex- magical experimentation. Um, there's a couple of things I'm working on right now that won't get released uh, for uh, testing with trusted friends or out in the world until I've played with it myself, whether that's an oil or, or an herbal recipe of, of a medicinal sort or an incense or, or a particular ritual pattern. But I'm always experimenting to see what's possible. And I have a pile of books that are the uh, things I am absolutely not interested in, but I'm forcing myself to read them. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> yeah, because uh, the, one, I think one of the weaknesses that I've seen most frequently is that when we only read the things that we are actually naturally drawn to, we create big gaps in our knowledge and awareness. It's a different kind of echo chamber. Um, when, when, when we only pick books in, on topics that truly interest us. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm so glad you said that. I mean, I, I laugh when you say you got the stack of books, you don't want to, you know, things you're not interested yeah. in, you're going to read it anyway, but you're right. Uh, if our noses are only ever in the pagan and occult material, then you're not going to it's be very good. prepared for that magic to actually work in the world. Um, so I like that you point that out. They used mm-hmm. something in there uh, about being an elder. And mm-hmm. I've been in some discussions recently with some people about exactly what an elder is and what that means. So now that you've brought it up, I'm curious what your thoughts are on what makes an elder, what qualifies one to be an elder of any tradition. Well, it's not just years. 
though I do think that it helps uh, to have uh, years on the planet just to get experience. But I think that uh, the way that, I'll say that the way that I'm using Elder applies to my community. And your mileage will vary or be different elsewhere. But an elder is specifically uh, anchored to a community. And what, because otherwise, you're not an elder, you're a celebrity. Yeah. You're not an elder, you may be a well known professor. And I'm using that term uh, for somebody who's very knowledgeable uh, about a particular field of study in magic. Uh, the way we use elder, it's attached to the is you are accountable to and responsible for doing what you can for the health and well-being of a specific collection of people. Now, that doesn't mean that you aren't actively involved in many other things that are not your uh, inner group. And in fact, uh, some people argue that I have to that I have to rebalance how much time I uh, give to which parts of the world besides uh, the assembly. But if you are because a, an elder is created by a community, an elder does not arise out of themselves. Because and then I'm going to make a distinction there because one can be an elder without being an adept. One can be an adept without being an elder. One can be a uh, uh, master craftsperson at something without being any good at other things, it, it becomes a question of the expectations. And I know people that are elders in the community because they've been around, or they, the world word is applied to them because they've been around for decades, but they, and, and they've seen a lot, but they don't function as an elder or are not currently functioning as an elder. Are you actively teaching? Are you mentoring? Are you uh, engaged in uh, arbitrating disputes uh, uh, and trying to make peace or, or uh, you know, to, to pull from your heathen stuff? Uh, an elder's job is, is making sure that frith happens. So I think part of the problem we have is that we use words like elder in different communities and they don't mean the same thing and they're very loosely defined. I think part of the problem we have, and uh, I'm using a rather big we and because I'm including multiple different communities potentially. The person that I would go to for um, advice because, or, or, or help because my heart's broken, um, someone, someone dear, to, in, dear has died, or uh, I, I have, haven't a clue about what I want to do next with my, with my life is not exactly the same person that I would go to as like, I have this um, healing ritual that I've been trying to work on for years. I've gotten it better. It feels like there's something missing. And I, you know, this is what I'm doing. And this is the way I'm balancing out, blah, 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 and filling all the, fill in all the arcane details. And it is not necessarily going to be the person that I would open my heart to may not have the technical skill or background to help me with the other part. Right. So I think there are different kinds of roles. Um, and it, and clergy is a funny word. Uh, someone can be uh, a, a, a priestess, priest, clergy person who has a very strong devotional life and strong spiritual life and be crap at dealing with human beings. <laughs> yes. And there are people that don't necessarily have the uh, strong call to work with the powers or the gods or fill in the blank for what do you want to call them? Uh, but they sure have a profound love of the work of being human and the work of trying to blend uh, their life with the life of others to, for mutual benefit. And they ha may have, they have an awareness of a different kind of spirituality, a different kind of path or tradition. So I, I think this all falls down on the fact that most of the communities that identify in this very broad idea of, of whatever uh, pagan, heathen, magical, spiritual, 
give it a couple of give it a couple of uh, years and every year we'll add one more thing to it just like uh you know lgbtq you know goes on forever and we add more letters to the alphabet to that mm-hmm. the community keeps expanding in terms of what it's trying to describe itself as but the problem is it still has this lingering thing of that there should be individuals that fit the bill for everything one you know there's no st- such thing as a priestess priest clergy person, go the, you know, uh, magus, fill in the blank for whatever your group uses as the terminology, who would be ideal for all the tasks that are required to make for a healthy, developing spiritual slash magical community. Yeah. I mean, I, I can take all that and, and absolutely agree. Um, seems like an elder is someone who embodies the spirit of a community for whatever that is it just may manifest itself in different skills yeah Yeah. now going back you talked about meditation being an important part of your practice in fact that was Mm -hmm. when i said you know tell me about your what your practice looks like today that was the first First thing thing out of your mouth and i like that you even stress the importance of meditation in your writing um you yeah, know, I do. I'm a professional hypnotist and a hypnosis instructor, mm-hmm. and the one of the first things I demand my clients learn is meditation. So, I am I'm on mo- I'm on board. I'm the choir. I absolutely mm-hmm. understand the importance of meditation, but I'm curious. Why did you start meditation? What were some of your early experiences with it? Ah, uh, uh, my first. Official, I, I knew what I was doing was meditation. Uh, I would say I came to it for the wrong reasons when I first started. Uh, I approached meditation initially as a modality, as, 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 as a method by which to control uh, tension or agitation or anxiety. I used meditation as a form of relaxation, which is really not what it's meant for, even though it can, it can have that result. So my first foray into officially, you know, and and the first thing I tried was TM because it was easy to get to. Uh, Transcendental meditation for for, uh, people who have not heard the abbreviation because it's it's still around. But but, uh, when I was a young pup, it was like the most popular thing. And so, you know, the reason I went for it was was strictly for psychological reasons, honestly, or psychological and emotional reasons. Though I, in retrospect, I realized that uh, I had been doing everything to set myself up for meditation as a regular practice since I was a kid. I would uh, find myself uh, fixating on on objects, on sounds, on flickering light, on any number of things, and I would just go in deep. And sometimes I would have a particular idea I would work on. And sometimes I would just, you know, dissolve into the environment. So I already had a thing that I was doing as a child that kind of led me to find, oh, this is comfortable. This is easy. And in my 20s, I did a lot of meditating or variations thereof because I was doing too much. And people are always saying that, you know, uh, if you're really busy, you really need to meditate. And I can say that, yeah, there was a point in my life that I was working full time, going to school full time and involved in uh, three organizations of which I was an officer, which were ones that were I that I actually committed energy to. That was not just a showing up for meetings. I only managed to do that because I was also doing a hard reboot and hard reset on my brain and my psyche pretty regularly by including meditation as, as part of my practice. Yeah, I, I agree. Meditation is one of those things that it does exactly what you said, almost a reboot. Um, why do you find meditation to be important beyond that? I mean, it's something you've kept practicing over this year, over all these years. Why is it such an important part of your work? So often people will ask me, how do you tell 
if a, um, a spirit or a goddess or an energy or something that you're perceiving or feeling either in divination or in ritual or in attempts at contact with spirits or, 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 the, or the goddesses or gods, how do you know what's, if it's true or not? Or how do you know if it feels right? And aside from all the you know, logical things like, well, you test the information and you don't just assume that everything was accurate. You see if it plays out as an expected in the real world, et cetera. But what I find is that the more I meditate or if I include meditation as a part of my regular practice, I develop a better ear for, is this true or not? Is this truly uh, a separate uh, ex- energy that I'm experiencing it, or is it simply another voice of, that's a part of my psyche coming up to the surface? So that cl- it, it, it helps to clarify, or I'm going to compare it to uh, it keeps the it keeps the instrument in tune. Very few people have perfect pitch. Most uh, I don't. Most people require. Uh, tuning forks or pitch pipes or some device to put musical instruments back into tune. Meditation helps to keep my my uh, myself in tune so that I can better discern what is and isn't real, what is or isn't of me, and that's that's an important thing. And I don't think that there's a a, a better tool than that other than repeated experience and exposure to getting discernment. Yeah, I. You absolutely sum it up in one word, discernment. That is the, for magical practitioners, that Mm -hmm. is the payoff for meditation. Um, Yeah. It's got a whole huge list of benefits why you should be doing it anyway. So Mm -hmm. um, listen to uh, Professor Evo and do your meditation, children. (laughs) 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 Now, meditation, I'd say, is getting more common probably in magical practitioners' lives. Um, I don't get a lot of raised eyebrows when I talk about meditation anymore. Uh, I credit uh, that showing up in a lot of really good books in the last decade or so. Yeah. That helps. And it's getting a lot more media coverage too. So that helps. So we know what a more common aspect of your practice is. What's an unusual habit that you do that might even be considered uh, really weird by outsiders or even insiders? Hmm. Well, I, this is giving me pause because I'm probably weirder than most people. Know. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that but I actually think that's true <clears throat> of, of most people that uh, are, are serious uh, about their magical practices for many years or their spiritual practices for many years. Um, I I don't know. I, I suppose it's that uh, I I I am my own guinea pig. I mean, uh, I I don't inflict uh, anything on on other people until I've tested it on myself, which is not always which is not always great. Uh, sometimes that's meant uh, anything from you know recording a path working or or, or or a chant that I just wrote and listening to it to see how it affects me. Or if it's an herbal thing, creating the the uh, potion or incense and seeing what it does. Or um, recently, I was testing a new uh, uh, shielding warding system, and the only way to be sure was to get uh, you know six or seven of, of my trusted magical peers to you know intentionally attack me. I said, "Hey, I want to test this. Could you go? Could you guys attack me?" <laughs> 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 because. <laughs> How else are you yeah, going to well, test it? How did it? that go? Uh, I, I found two or three little flaws in it that I that I can work on. Uh, so that, but but the technique and the uh, method seemed solid because uh, only one of them got a solid hit, and uh, he got back a little bit of a of a, of a backlash from it. So I'm I'm going to call that as a, it's working in the right <laughs> direction. But I, I I but I think you know I think I experiment more than people think. I mean I know that for some people. Um, it seems odd to, to, uh, well, but you know, it, but you, you, you thought it through clearly or, 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 uh, it came through you through a God or a spirit or, or, or from a past life or whatever it's like. And, and I will say that I have had a lot of parts of my practice come from that very personal, 
initially unproven source, whether that's the spirits or, or past lives or, or, or other sources of information. But, but then it's always tests. But here's, here's the thing. I, I, 90% of my work, whether it's um, writing a ritual, writing a book about whatever it is, uh, making, making astrology sensible for magical people or, or different ways of creating sacred space or developing your psychism or whatever, almost all of it is translating it so that it will work for as many other kinds of people than myself. So in a lot of ways, I think of myself as, as, a, as a translator, or this will sound uh, horribly uh, bogus and bizarre in some ways, but in some senses, I think of myself as uh, part Julia Child, part Carl Sagan, uh, or any or or any or uh, any any other the sorts of people that try to bring things that seem out of reach into a very concrete and understandable fashion that people that aren't gifted or plagued by by uh, almost constant visions. Um, I'm, I'm giving a clue about myself. Uh, can make sense and make use of things. So I think of myself as as somebody who's primary work is translating what happens to me all the time into something that's of value to others that uh, I'll give you an example of the, of the kind of, thank goddess this does not happen often. And it has not happened for a few more for several years. It may not happen yet, but I've been doing uh, workshops, readings, and uh, healing at a, a weekend conference. And by the end of it, I was fried because I'd been wide open the whole weekend. On the way home from said conference, a couple people say, hey, we've got to pick up some stuff and uh, we might as well um, pop in and I've got to pick up some art supplies and, and well, you know, we're at the mall. Let's let's just get get a bite to eat and hit the road again. 20 feet in the door, I my 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 normal my normal filters went down and suddenly I had to grab uh, uh, a friend's hand and say, uh, guide me to a table because all my filters were down and basically the room looked like, uh, a, uh, I might as well have been dropping acid. Everybody was glowing. The floor was transparent. The walls were transparent. Uh, people looked like, uh, you know, blown glass colored lit up neon. And it's like, okay, I'm going to have to sit here until this passes. That kind of stuff doesn't happen often. But my point is I've always known that my internal reality is very different than a lot of people's reality. And I have to figure out how to a present well and B uh, come up with ways to convert my experiences into something that is useful to others. Well, first I think uh, I know I, and many others are glad that you are willing to experiment on yourself as such and provide material for the rest of the world. So, uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but that puts you in a position to ask sort of a, let's see, how do I want to say this? You're doing a lot of experimenting and of course mm -hmm. you're going to get results and feedback from, from all these experiments. And it's the, the feedback you get is inevitably going to challenge some deep held belief or some, some way of looking at the world. Yep. And with that said, in the la let's say in the last five years, what new belief or action or habit or something that through these experiments has most improved your life today? Something that became stronger and stronger for me is that uh, ultimately there is no difference between all forms of, of spirit, whether it's humans, animals, goddesses, and gods, it's just a matter of scale, a matter of individuation, and a matter of specialization and, and length of practice. But that ultimately there is more in common uh, between the smallest uh, fragment of consciousness to the most expansive and uh, wide-reaching fragment of consciousness that we call goddesses or gods and I've gotten more and more examples of how anything and everything that I learn about uh, divinities uh, has, has application in the development of humans. And everything that I observe in humans um, gives glimpses into the 
uh, structure and evolutionary pattern of divine beings. I'll give you a quick example. Uh, and, and by the way, uh, all systems are valid, they're, but they're just different. They're arguing which is better is like trying to decide uh, if you build a better house uh, using uh, English measurements or metric. It doesn't matter as long as the tools work. Mm-hmm. So, for example, I, I work a lot with the idea of the lower self, middle self, and higher self, though there's a lot of different names for those and, and lots of elaboration on those. But in observing people engaged in divine possession of various kinds, drawing down, say, fill in the blank for whatever, uh, it became very apparent that sometimes uh, the nature of the information or the energy or the pattern that was coming through was because what we were seeing was the lower self of that God or the middle self of that being or the higher self of that goddess or, or ancestor fill in the blank. And very rarely did I see somebody contain all three portions of the lower middle and upper self of, of the being that they were uh, carrying or communicating for. And that when it happened, it was amazing and miraculous. But the rest of the time that, uh, it was simply that they were only tapping into a portion or one channel uh, or one layer of that consciousness. So it begs the question, uh, and, and I've been working on that, and I think it's changed t- some of my practice. To the degree that uh, all parts of self are active when you are doing work, then it is possible for um, the engagement with uh, energies, forces, consciousnesses of different types to actually be fuller and more balanced. So it, it's a, a different variation of the know thyself, but it's more about if you are not actually engaged in awakening and strengthening um, the various portions, whatever system you use to divide up the different parts of self or, or, or the psyche, if all of those aren't engaged in your spiritual or magical work, then one of the flaws or one of the lacks or one of the distortions is not that the person is, is, is adding something, but that they're excluding something. I, so it's, yeah, I have seen where you do the, um, the higher self, middle self, and lower self model. And of course you're right. It gets much more detailed or, yeah. or different traditions have different ways of calling that out. Um, how can someone experience the difference in a higher self, middle self, and lower self? Okay. Um, have you ever caught something falling off a table, a shelf someplace or and uh, you manage to catch it without thinking about it, and uh, with a perhaps remark that "How did I do that?" Sure. Okay, that was your lower self doing that work, and it's not because it's more than it's not simply instinct or muscle memory. Because frankly, uh, instinct or muscle memory uh, only goes so far because uh, you had to calculate the speed, the motion, the hand position. All, all those things so that you could be at just the right place, the right moment uh, to catch it. Um, have you ever walked into a room and felt and know without, without any, any evidence that uh, there had just been a heated argument in the room and everybody had put back on their polite faces before you stepped in? <laughs> oh, absolutely. Okay. So anytime that you act with perfect grace and perfect motion, uh, it, it's more likely to be your lower self uh, that, that did that. Anytime that you have a undeniable knowing of, of emotional quality of, of, of a space or an individual, that's likely to, to uh, be your lower self. So the first thing is simply to become aware of the different times in your life, day to day, where uh, your lower self is actually expressing itself but since it's not a being that, uh, and I'm calling it a separate thing for the moment, since it's a being that does not use language as as we are communicating with right now, then uh, it, it tends to be ignored because middle self's job is to uh, uh, keep things uh, rolling and under control, sometimes to the detriment of, of us. Let's, uh, let's jump uh, to, up to the higher self for a second. 
have you ever seen a symbol or and and immediately had a reaction to it or 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 a sense of what it meant yes or read a passage uh and suddenly uh got a an understanding or a glimpse of this is what they're leaving out oh yeah yep okay or, or when we so, so that uh, in some regards the higher self is the place where we connect to that which is larger, more expansive, um, less boundaried intelligence. So that when, in, in some regards, the only reason that communication is possible at all between different so- kinds of spiritual beings, or frankly, be, I think between different species of, of, uh, of uh, physical life between humans and animals or whatnot is because we have a piece that is in common in that spit, that bit of spirit, that bit that is the came from, from the essence that was, uh, you know, dipped and poured into us. If you want to use that idea, uh, that's our secret decoder ring. That's our like calling to like, uh, the, the reason that you have a connection to pieces of knowledge is because somewhere, somewhere, that is known and by, and and your higher self has a connection to that. It is um, still not exactly a representational language. It comes in a flash or it comes in a whole chunk because also uh, linear self, middle self loves a leads to B leads to C linear time stuff. Um, And there's a, and, Frankly, it's a good survival trait to p- attend to linear time, but the higher self uh, sees it all. It lives in lives in an eternal now kind of presence. So, knowledge from the past can sometimes uh, have its uh, cliff notes written there for you because you're reading from from the book that was uh, written in written elsewhere, or written into time space, written into the memory of the universe itself. And that's getting a little woo woo, but, <laughs> but I think, any, but any time that you pay attention over the course of the day or a course of a week or a course of the month, you'll find pretty easily. I think that was my high, higher self uh, uh, showing itself or, or my lower self showing itself, or I like to do, you know, uh, games that uh, engage the middle self. Um, I've, I've told people numerous times to sit at a table, put out three plates, put out three candles, uh, and, uh, close your eyes and, and, and invite for, uh, invite your, uh, higher self and your lower self to come sit at the table and talk to you. This will, so, this will appeal to, to a different part of your life. I've also encouraged people to, uh, draw a circle, put a triangle in, inside it, stand in the triangle and, uh, invoke and summon all their parts back into themselves. Oh, nice. That's an interesting experiment. It, it works surprisingly well. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> Uh, Aiden Walker in his book, six ways has a reclaiming your power practice. And it did just one of the, one of the books on my pile of must uh, read. It should be on everyone's <laughs> must read pile. I I'm on record as describing it as the book. I wish I had when I got started in all this, uh, he there you go. wrote that book. Um, but yeah, he's got a reclaiming, right? That, I mean, you don't stand in the, the circle in the triangle, but the right. idea is the same as you're calling your power back to you, your parts back to you. And I like that. Before we run out of too much time, I wanted to talk to you about your book, Keys to Perception. Yeah. And um, first of all, it's excellent. Uh, once again, you've done a great job putting material out there for the world. But I'm curious, why did you feel compelled to write a book on psychic abilities? Big secret. All my books are actually uh, the same book, but I had to split it up into lots of books. And in my head, that's the way it plays. Because if you are going to engage in magical work, spiritual work, frankly, even devotional work, the better you get at opening, clarifying, refining your senses, the better you're going to be at all your work. So I've always had 
chunks of the psychic development stuff in all of the classes and that I've given in all the work I've done with, with our various covens. So it's always, you know, just kind of like woven into it, but <clears throat> um, that's not the way you do things in the publishing world. So this is the book that is focused on, on the psychic development stuff in the same way that I think of astrology as being one of the most powerful magical languages. So I wrote the book, a book on astrology for, for witches and pagans. So with an emphasis on not becoming an astrologer, but on how to use uh, those concepts or casting sacred space about different kinds of magical containers for different uh, purposes or spirit speak, which among other things includes uh, information on divine possession. So I guess every book I write is an attempt to encapsulate something I think is important that all fits together. And there are, there are, each stands alone, but there are linkages between them because in the end, I hope by the time that I pass, and may that be a very long time from now, that if somebody uh, picks up uh, any number of my books, um, it'll, it'll be a, a, a good time capsule and uh, a good little seed bank for if you will like doing things this way, this, this is something that you can replicate. And I, I owe you an apology for to, to rush into this point, but it's absolutely required. Nobody gets out alive without this one. Um, i have a portion of my audience that are what i would describe and they would too as paranormal investigators yep meaning they go out with uh, different tools and technology and explore haunted locations i've done some of that yeah me too i'm a big fan and i'm also a client Mm -hmm. now (laughs) um Let's say someone comes to you and says, Evo, you know, this is a friend down the street or a neighbor mm-hmm. or whatever. It says, I know you're into witchcraft and magic and all this stuff. And I uh, never wanted to believe in any of it, but my house is haunted. Right. Um, shit's moving. We've tested everything out. Uh, I need help. How would you help them? Well, if they are actually... Uh... <clears throat> Somebody who I believe is speaking uh, honestly and credibly uh, and not seeking just attention. I'm saying these things because I owned a metaphysical shop for about a decade. So you can imagine. Oh boy. Yeah, I can imagine. So I would say I have to come out. I have to I have to go to your place and, uh, and, and check it out for myself because it's impossible to know without boots on the ground and actually feeling what's going on in that space. One that was uh, a case that I went on that was, you know, it was pretty serious and I trusted the referral because it was somebody who I knew was very level headed. And uh, this was not some, the person who was their friend was not magical, was not enamored of any of, of this sort of stuff. So they, they didn't actually want it to be happening, which is an important consideration. But uh, she and her two kids uh, were having bizarre experiences. And and uh, I, I checked out the place and discovered that there was nothing evil. There was nothing uh, demonic or any of the things that other people had told them and scared the crap out of them. However, the building that was now their home used to be uh, two separate small buildings that were a public building. The, the town pool used to be there. They'd filled in the large concrete pool. The shower house had been uh, had been uh, gutted uh, to to a little restaurant and others. Anyway, they'd glued to they'd connected all these different structures and filled in the pool. And every place in that spot was resonating not with dead people, but it was just layers upon layers of people laughing, people screaming, people running around. Uh, decades of, of, of people cavorting and because of where it was uh, and some of the geolo- geological stuff was going on. Um, it was the perfect recording device for everything. And anybody with a scrap of sensitivity uh, or anybody who's, who, who remembers their dreams couldn't dream it or sleep in that house without having it like a, a, a loud noise of dozens of voices and people running around and motion. And, and, and why do I keep seeing water? It's like, but it wasn't a haunted house, but any, but everybody they'd talked to had said, oh, it's it's terribly haunted or it's this, that or the other thing. 
it requires openness to what's actually going on and no presuppositions of, of what the nature of the beastie is going to be. So when you go to a location, um, how do you, how do you approach the, the home? If you were going to investigate a house, for an example, um, are you doing something specific with the yeah. land before you get in? Are you going inside and using specific tools and techniques? I, I, well, okay. Before I even, well, before I even walk in the door, I'm looking to see what's going on with the land. Um, are there any uh, nature spirits, uh, land spirits that 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 uh, are in any way uh, cranky and disturbed by something that's been done in that space? So first, I introduce myself as I'm as I'm approaching the house or or and looking looking at the land and seeing what's going on there, introducing myself because that may be all that's going on. Um, I also get a pay really close attention as I am crossing the threshold entering through the doorway of the house. How come? Some houses have a very clearly defined, oh, this tr- somebody truly lives here. This is somebody's home. And I, f- and I just felt that I went from the outside to the inside. Others, there's almost no boundary to speak of. And that gives me clues about also what might be going on or why they can't get rid of whatever's there. Um, once in the house, I start paying attention and, you know, and, uh, I look at the walls, I look at the floor, I look at the ceiling and I am a visual person in, in addition to other things. And I go like, is there any spot that's glowing? Is there anything where I'm getting a little visual disturbance? Um, is the, the, because if there's a lot of stuff embedded in the actual structure of the house, I may begin to lean to, to the idea of this is all stuff that's been recorded and, and imprinted on the house. Um, I, 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 I do a hello and not, not, you know, and I, 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 I do get really annoyed when I see people investing, doing investigations of any kind where they try to, um, encourage distress or aggravation or challenge or anger on the part of anything that might be spiritually present to get a rise out of them. So instead I just put out a mental call, you know, is anybody here? Is anybody, is anybody present to, to, uh, communicate? doesn't always happen uh, that they get a response. I also ask uh, if the family or individual in question has any particular religious or spiritual beliefs, uh, whether or not uh, they would be willing to uh, call upon whatever it is that they work with for a moment, just to see, to see if there's any, not necessarily for protection at that moment, to, but to see if there is a reaction or if the energy changes in any way when somebody invokes something that they view as a beneficent positive, uh, being or, or, or God. Cause you know, there may, if there's no reaction to that, then that also begins to give clues. So I, I'm very systematic about, uh, trying to examine what all the possibilities could be and what the reactions or lack of reactions there are. But that, that's a whole nother talk. Honestly, we could talk for an hour just now. Oh. <laughs> I may very well bring you back to do just that. Uh, one of my favorite things about doing this show is obviously talking to incredible people like yourself, but um, asking other magical practitioners, pagans, occultists, you know, what would you do confronted with a, a haunted house and how would you approach it? Because we are not really the ones to grab all the tools and techniques that are so popularized no. by TV shows and go after it. We've, we've got a much different approach to these things. And mm-hmm. I like exposing my audience to the way we think about it. So thank you mm-hmm. very much for sharing your thoughts on that. But it brings me to a, a wider point. The landscape is dotted with abandoned hospitals and asylums Mm -hmm. and places Mm -hmm. of that nature Mm -hmm. that are popular locations for paranormal investigators to go um, look for evidence. And while I've participated in it myself, I've, I've got mixed feelings about the very existence of these places and my role and what I could do with them with my own abilities. How do you feel about these locations that are all over the place? It's going to sound weird, but uh, some of them are, 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 are uh, public health issues, frankly. Uh, if, you know, if, if we had a uh, magical or energetic uh, public health department, <laughs> some of the places, <laughs> some of the places would have been quarantined and cleaned up a long time ago. So, so I mean, 
in some places they should be turned into, if necessary, uh, shrines or considered to, to be uh, grave sites of a sort and treated with a certain amount of respect. In other cases, they, they literally need to be properly cleansed because, um, do you know the term miasma, bad atmosphere? Yes. Well, let's, let, let's, let's throw out this idea. When you die, your, your, let's, let's assume that you believe the idea that you have your physical body and then different layers of energy. You can think of them as the subtle bodies, different parts of, uh, of, of you that are your aura, if you will. And so the first thing that dies is your physical body. And then the one tightest in the etheric body also begins to disconnect uh, from this plane and begins to degrade. And ultimately, uh, the part of you that's the, the sum essence, the, 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 uh, the zip file that is you, uh, gets extracted and removed and moves on. And your various energy bodies that are, uh, are of a lower nature begin to fall apart or get embedded in buildings to uh, create residual hauntings or any number of things like that. But you know what? Our, our energy bodies are not as boundaried as our physical bodies. And if you are in a place, especially a place where there is an ongoing, or at least when they were active, an ongoing amount of pain and agony and emotional distress or physical distress and a sense of, of despair and, and mania and fill in all the lovely things you can associate. When people die in those settings, their spirits do, do move on. But you know what? Sometimes their lower subtle bodies um, remain empowered, don't degrade, don't fall apart completely, but remain empowered by the background energy of what's going on in that space. And sometimes they begin to merge with each other. And in the same way that uh, a group of people together create a group mind by simply thinking and working together, the, the, uh, the shells of the dead uh, can, can combine and merge into... Uh, composite beings that uh, feed off the energy, emotional energy of the space. And sometimes those get mistaken for, for demonic forces or, or, or extremely powerful ghosts, but they're no, not, not even any one individual. In a funny kind of way, they're, they're actually the equivalent of an astral zombie. That's interesting. I've never quite heard it put that way. We're, Frankenstein, we're, we're Frankenstein's monster of, of an astral zombie because it's the merging of, of – because uh, like calls to like. And anybody who's, who's uh, pain or, 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 or mental illness or, or pathology or whatever was resonant would be, combine and become this thing together. And then those reside in those places and becomes this malevolent atmosphere that is a composite being but without spirit. So it has no guiding principle. I want to ask you one more question during the yeah. regular portion of the show here. Um, mm -hmm. I found an older blog post where you talk about parting gifts between the living and the dead. And I found mm -hmm. the, the post to be uh, really intriguing. And I think the idea behind that's important. Uh, do, would you mind explaining what you mean by parting gifts? Um, I mean, good news, bad news is that uh, our organization's been around um, since uh, 84. And as a result, <laughs> some of our members mm -hmm. have died. Um, and, and we've developed a lot of different uh, practices around death. So we do... I think that the biggest thing, and I think that what we did at our retreat, which is also what I believe that blog post was about, is when um, when we think of our lives, we don't we don't remember our lives as a, a, a continuous uh, you know court reporter writing down everything that happened. We summarize it the way that people can uh, summarize things in a poem or a song or, or a story. And the, the parting gift of, of remembrance, uh, of, telling, uh, of telling stories about uh, people's lives and remembering the funny stories or the painful stories or the beautiful stories, that is not, it's not just, it is not just that it does good for the living, uh, though I think that that's an important thing. But there, these are gifts for those that have passed because we don't know uh, how long um, it takes for a person to finish processing their way into death. 
in the same way that when we come into life, uh, the birth process is, is, is difficult and fraught with risk and that it's, it takes a while after somebody uh, comes into this world to then be prepared to deal with this world and, and learn about how things work, et cetera, and review. Uh, okay, this is how my body works. This is how language works. I think that when we die, there's also a transition time after we actually arrive wherever we arrive, where we both look at the life we've had and then and where we came from and look to where we were. And we're now in this new place where we'll head. So the telling of our tales of that of that person's life, of our memories of them, of what impact they had on us, actually is um, like setting an altar for them, like giving giving them offerings. Uh, because, you know, they're not going to physically receive any offerings from us, but the telling of their stories in a refined, summarized, beautiful way, warts and all, I, I think that is something that uh, was true in that blog, and certainly when we just had our service in in uh, our at our annual retreat for for Vicky, who had side, died very suddenly, it was not just for our healing, but it actually feeds the dead. If you want to think of it that way, yeah, that's a nice way to think about it. And I really appreciate you sharing uh, a little inside information on how you approach death practices. Um, We've come towards the end of the regular broadcast here, <laughs> huh. and I, I, we've covered a pretty good range of topics, but if there's something that you would like to discuss that I haven't gotten to, uh, now's a good time to let me know. We're in really rough times, and, and, and honestly, be kinder to each other, be willing to cut people more slack. Um, I always assume that if somebody is uh, saying something ridiculous or doing something ridiculous, that I will have to observe that behavior more than once before I'm going to decide that that person's a problem. Uh, there are more things that can divide us now than ever, and social media is both a help and a hindrance in that regard. And though we come from many very different communities, um, we have to find ways in which to work together despite the fact that we are not the same and like-minded is not the same as same minded. So just a, a, a call out to, uh, uh, if somebody works, uh, is willing to work with you on a project, it doesn't matter if they won't work with you on another project. Will things be better if that one thing that you have in common gets done? Excellent point And a good reminder to everybody out there. I, uh, I especially like, constant reminders to everyone be a little nicer to each other yeah <laughs> all right well evo thank you again for being here i greatly appreciate your time and you sharing your knowledge and your insight with everyone uh, it's been a lot of fun talking to you and for everyone out there thank you again for listening i as always appreciate you being here if you want to hear more of what evo and i talk about go to weirdwebradio.com and click join the membership or go to patreon.com slash weirdwebradio. And before we head out the door, Evo, where can everybody find you? I'm really easy to find. EvoDominguezJr.com is my website. I'm also on Facebook and Instagram. And uh, look me up. I also do a lot of uh, traveling, go to a lot of events and gatherings and hope to see some folks uh coming up either at Mystic South in Atlanta or Iowa Lamas Fest or Convocation or fill in the blank. I, I get around. <laughs> Fair enough. All right, folks. Thank you again for being here. Stay weird out there, my friends. Okay, gang, that's a wrap on this episode of Weird Web Radio. Once again, thank you all for listening. Now, it's time for you to go join the official Weird Web Radio membership. Go to patreon.com slash weirdwebradio and you can choose your rewards and become a member today. Enjoy all the exclusive benefits, inside information, and plenty of bonus audio with each guest. Now, you can find the show at weirdwebradio.com and weirdwebradio.libsyn.com. The show is listed on Facebook and Twitter as Weird Web Radio. And you can find me on Instagram as just Lonnie underscore Scott. Please remember to rate and comment and share the shows that you like. 
and it helps others to find us in all the search results. Shoot me an email if you want to be a guest on the show or if you know someone that would be a great guest in upcoming episodes. You can send that to weirdwebradio at gmail.com. Seek the mysteries and delights in life, my friends. As always, stay weird out there. Thank you.